Hey, I want to welcome everyone uh, to our webinar today. This is Mark Pryor. I'm a former U.S. Senator from Arkansas, served from 2003 to 2015. I want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, we are really excited here at Venable to have you today. And we want to talk about uh, the 2016 uh, election in the aftermath. We all recognize that 2016 could be one of the most consequential elections in American history. And so today we want to talk about that and we recognize that during the campaign and during the transition and, you know, honestly with groups on both the right and the left, there's been a lot of discussion about deregulation, about executive orders, about midnight regulations, maybe the Congressional Review Act and other things. And so what we want to do here for this hour is we want to tune out all the rhetoric and tune into the facts. And so uh, we want you to, we want to spend some time talking about the real process and what we can all really expect. And we also want to answer your questions. And to do the questions, we're going to do the, use the chat feature. But first, let me introduce our three presenters today. And uh, I'll turn it over to them here just in about 60 seconds. But our first presenter is John Cooney. He brings 35 years of experience in regulatory policy making and regulatory litigation. He served as assistant to the Solicitor General at the Department of Justice and as Deputy General Counsel for Litigation Regulatory Affairs at OMB. Then we're going to have Larry Norton, who served as the former General Counsel of the Federal Election Commission. He's now Chair of Venable's Government Division, and he co-chairs the firm's Political Law Group. And third, we have Carol Ward. And before going into private practice, Carol was a former attorney at the U.S. Department of the Treasury during the financial crisis. She's now a member of our, our legislative and government affairs group and brings extensive experience in consumer financial services and administrative law. So without any further ado, John, the, the, the line is yours. Good morning. My name is John Cooney, and I'll try to give you a general overview of the four tools that are available to the Trump administration in the regulatory space to try to change um, um, rules of the Obama administration with which it's unhappy or to institute new programs of deregulation in general. The four tools are, um, first, new deregulatory rulemakings. This is the broad thrust of any president's um, program to change the rules by his predecessor, and everything flows through this course. But as you'll hear, it's slow, and so that the agencies and the president try to come up with other ways to avoid the difficulties of the deregulatory rulemaking process. The next three items are the three most commonly used tools. Um, repeal by executive order of executive orders issued by prior presidents. Next, midnight regulations, the regulations that the Obama administration is rolling out now to complete its regulatory agenda and that we'll be waiting for the Trump administration when it gets into office. And finally, congressional action, disapproval by Congress under the Congressional Review Act for a subset of major rules of those that the Obama administration is publishing right here at the end in the form of midnight rules. So I'll give you the base case first. Um, the process that everyone is worried about because it takes so long and why the president will want to try um, shortcuts to avoid having to get on this pace. New rule makings, as I said, are by far and away the most common method of deregulation, but they have drawbacks, well-known drawbacks that the new administration will be taking into account in trying to figure out how to work around. The first and um, the, ultimately the killer problem with new rule makings are it, they are very slow. They have to go through a notice and public comment period, and as all of you on the phone know, um, those can be very complicated and they can take a long time, and they use an enormous number of uh, agency resources, resources that will not necessarily be available to the new administration in its first months on the job because it's not going to have a lot of its um, subordinate political appointees in place and therefore will have a lesser degree of control over the agency than it will have in subsequent years. The, the problem with speed is that first it allows opponents of the changes time to get organized and to figure out and present a more effective defense and to coordinate with people 
who are going to be objecting to other um, administration deregulatory efforts. And so um, more of a common front will evolve, common themes to oppose um, changes in regulations will emerge over time. Another issue is that the career civil service will have a much more significant influence over the rule than it will later in an administration. The career civil servants um, will have fewer political appointees to um, communicate the uh, administration's preferences in the policy sphere and fewer political appointees who know what the facts are and can know if the career staff is uh, highlighting all the information that's available that could be used to justify the policy preference of the new administration. Um, those are the internal features within the agency itself, but there are substantial problems in court um, with new rules. Since the early 1980s, it's been established that deregulatory rules are no different from any other rule. They're subject to judicial review under exactly the same standards as the regulation it seeks to replace and roll back. Um, that is, um, essentially, that the statute must authorize what the agency is trying to do and that there must be a good factual record that's adequate to support the deregulatory effort. The key case on this, some of you may remember, was uh, passive restraints, seat belts and cars, that was put in in the early days of the um, um, Reagan administration to try to roll back the Carter administration rule. And um, that, um, that deregulatory effort went down in flames in the D.C. Circuit on review, uh, never went to the Supreme Court, but has established the threshold that all deregulatory rules have had to meet since then. Um, the, um, to come back to the two points I made, the statute must justify the agency action, but um, the courts in 2009 in the Fox case, in an opinion by Justice Scalia, I think, said that an interpretation changing the agency's construction of the statute is entitled to deference if it's permissible under the law. So if the agency can establish that there was ambiguity in the statute and it's come up with a reasonable new interpretation, uh, that's fine. The courts will defer to that statutory interpretation as long as there's a reasonable justification for it. But then the battle shifts to the factual record. The record on a deregulatory rule must um, support the outcome, including the agency's consideration of costs and effects on human health and the environment. That task is likely to be more difficult in this transition than it has been in prior transitions um, because um, the um, Obama administration put a lot of emphasis on the quality of cost-benefit analysis and the risk analysis that went into its rule. So there will be an established record that opponents of the rule can point to um, that say that the facts command the decision that the Obama administration uh, put out and that there is no other um, outcome that is permissible given the limitations on the facts. And that's important because it would take the, um, uh, the uh, Trump administration some period of years to gather new evidence if they wanted to have a head-on clash with the facts as interpreted by the Obama administration. And so for that reason, um, it's, the, it should not be underestimated um, how much the facts compiled in the record by the Obama administration is still going to exercise influence and how it will be important for people who want to challenge rules to be able to get to the new administration uh, the best information that they have and the best interpretations of the evidence that have been seen before to show that a deregulatory change would be justifiable on a rational basis review standard. So that's the base case. That's what the administration is going to try to work around. Um, to come to the specific tools that they have in their uh, toolkit, um, the first one is executive orders. Uh, many presidential policies are established by executive order, and so having an executive order to repeal an Obama executive order is a very useful um, tool in the Trump toolbox, but it has limits. Uh, the most obvious one, but one that is very little known for people who practice anywhere other than the executive order practice, is that executive orders are basically um, glorified press releases. They are um, uh, issued to the heads of executive departments and agencies um, and tell the executive agency heads what the president wants done. Um, they are very important documents. No agency head will underestimate their internal significance because if the president tells you he wants to do something, it doesn't matter whether it comes in a letter or a phone call or a call from his chief of staff or in an executive order, um, 
you are betting your career if you um, fail to comply at least to some degree with an executive order that the president has issued to you. But the, the term of art is that executive orders are politically enforceable only by the president and his staff against his appointees, which means the president can do everything from um, not inviting you to the next Christmas party to cutting your appropriation and budget time to firing you if he wants to, if you don't go along with his policy preferences. So that's how most executive orders are enforceable, by the, the threat of the president um, um, uh, putting you in the doghouse if you don't go along with him. Uh, the great majority of executive orders are not um, enforceable in court. Um, the most important current executive orders all state that they do not grant rights to third parties, meaning you can't take it into court and saying that an agency deviated from the command of the president or, or that, um, that the president um, um, somehow um, it, it didn't do something right in the process. Because these are policy statements, the president has a great deal more latitude as to how he goes about it. Um, the key that allows that to work is that most regulatory statutes delegate authority to the heads of executive agencies and not to the president. And when the authority lies in the agency, then the president himself cannot impose changes on the regulations that were adopted um, uh, by a prior administration, by a prior agency head. He has to work with his agency head um, to um, have the agency head adopt independently changes on the regulations. And um, it has been known to happen that uh, agency heads have refused to go along um, with executive orders, and they try to fight that out with the White House staff about how draconian the White House sanctions should be um, if the uh, agency head doesn't go along with the full letter of the president's executive order. Um, but as I, I've clarified all that by saying it's generally the case that the president doesn't have this authority. There are some statutes, such as Superfund, that delegate the authority directly to the president. And uh, there are some executive orders by which the president directly implements the authority delegated to him um, by Congress. Um, most of the international sanctions come under um, a statute that gives the president the direct authority to do it. So the president there can change regulations by the stroke of a pen as long as he complies with the processes that are set forth in that statute. Uh, I know that there are several people on the line also who are in the defense contracting space, and they'll be familiar with the statute that gives the president the authority to establish rules that directly govern federal contractors. And there have been a number of those rules under the um, uh, Obama administration um, that will probably be um, targets for consideration as to whether they will be rolled back or modified to some degree. So that's the executive order, of course. It's, uh, it, it's a potent tool, but not as legally effective um, as the other ones that I'm going to talk about now, which do depend upon um, the direct statutory authority of agency heads and how the president interacts with them. One you've heard quite a bit of talk about is uh, midnight regulations issued by the Obama administration. Um, the administration um, issued a memorandum in uh, November 2015 to get people thinking about this and to tell them the processes that the Obama administration um, would apply on trying to get rules out between the president, the conclusion of the election and the January 20th, the inauguration at noon. Um, typically, there are a large number of important rules issued during this period because at some point, Roughly in the late spring before a presidential election, a window goes down in the Office of Management and Budget and no more major rules are let out the door unless the president thinks they'll be effective tools in the upcoming campaign. Um, and that happened in this administration and it has in the last four or five. Um, the regulatory agencies simply held back their rules. Um, they worked with people in OMB to obtain authority to issue the rules once the um, elections were behind them. And OMB was looking quite carefully at the quality of the rules that were going to be put out and whether the facts supported those rules or not. Well, now the, the window is opened after the election, and OMB and the agencies are working to get these rules out the door. Um, if you're watching the Federal Register, you'll see that um, not every day, but frequently, several times a week, there are now very significant rules that are starting to come out of the administration. And these, are, these midnight rules will be high on the list of things that um, – um, that trade associations and others um, in the private sector will be very focused on, and Congress will be highly focused on them, as I'll explain in a few minutes. Um, 
There are some bottlenecks, though, in, uh, tr for the administration to try to get rules out the door. Um, the primary bottleneck is obtaining approval from the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which does the staff work for the White House policy process on these rules, and it won't send a rule forward to the White House for uh, final approval unless it's satisfied with the quality of the work. Almost the worst thing that an administration can do is to get caught up in the last minute and get something out the door, and then it turns out it's not going to work, or it, um, after the fact, it, um, it passed into disrepute the entire regulatory review process that the Obama administration ran. So OIRA is continuing to um, exercise um, a high level of policy review of these rules, which is why they don't all appear at once. They only appear when they're ready. And the second bottleneck is you have to get your rule printed in the Federal Register by January 19th, because a number of things turn on the day in which a rule is published. Um, in order to have legal force and effect and be subject to, um, um, and to constitute a final agency action that's subject to review in court under the Administrative Proce Procedures Act, um, the rule actually has to be published in the Federal Re Register. Mere signature by the agency head is not sufficient, and having the rule over to the Office of Federal Register in the queue for publication is not sufficient. The rule actually must be published in the Federal Register to have legal force and effect. Now, to sort of break that down a little bit for you, a published rule can be revised only by the adoption of a new rule issued by the new agency head under the Trump administration, but only after there has been notice and comment about um, changing the rules. Um, this is the counterpart of what I told you in the first place about how slow the basic thrust of changing the rules is. Um, and whether you have to go through a notice and comment rulemaking depends upon whether your rule appeared in the Federal Register by January 19th. A rule not published by January 19th can be withdrawn by the new agency head simply by sending a, uh, a note to the um, uh, Federal Register following up on an agitated phone call, undoubtedly, which says, I disagree with my predecessor. Um, send me that rule back. It was not published by January 19th. I revoke it. It's not going to go into effect. Send back the rule. Don't publish it. Um, and then. Um, the new agency it also has a greater degree of authority over rules that were published all right, in the Federal Register, but whose effective date has not arrived yet. Um, say that the effective date was going to be uh, February 20th, or in some cases, uh, some Obama administration rules aren't going to become effective until October. And so those rules fall into this category. You know, technically, the effective date can be extended only by a new rulemaking, and a uh, new rule signed by the new agency head. Um, but uh, that is certainly true for any rule for which the effective date is going to be extended for a long period of time. Uh, that's been established by the court since the Reagan transition from um, um, Jimmy Carter, um, where some agency rules um, were extended for indefinite periods, and the courts rejected that approach and said, no, you need to have a new notice and comment rulemaking in order to do that. Um, but they, in practice, there's some play in the joints there. If an agency head only extends for a short period of time, a reasonably short period of time, then there won't be an opportunity for any of the challengers to go into court and complain that the review period um, cannot be extended. Uh, by the time the uh, people can get a, um, a case filed or a court can hear it, um, the, um, the stay on changes will already have gone out of effect. And so um, the, the period of time available for a challenge is so short that an agency can, get, can buy some time as long as it doesn't overplay that, um, this um, sort of unwritten rule and, um, and uh, you try to get too long an extension without going through the notice and comment process. So to deal with the midnight regulation problem, the Trump administration will have an order issued within minutes after the president is inaugurated, which will um, be sent to all the new agency heads, directing them not uh, to withdraw any rule that has been submitted to the Federal Register but has not yet been published, and to stay the effective dates of all rules submitted by the Obama administration that have not yet been published and, uh, and have not gone into effect. Um, this can be a very significant number of rules. Um, in the transition from the Clinton administration to the George W. Bush administration, Republican agencies withdrew 124 rules, and they postponed the effective date of another 90 rules. 
So that was a tremendous number of rules that had gone through the regulatory process and had obtained policy approval, um, but were su suspended. And they were suspended um, in, in good measure until um, the Bush administration could get the um, working groups in the White House together and the working group could review those rules and determine which ones were they agreed with or which ones were more or less um, technical in nature and would be permitted to go into effect. And then to identify the smaller group of rules to which the administration had strong policy objections and to figure out the most effective way to deal with them, whether they could be um, changed in any way short of having to go through the, um, the full rulemaking process. And if the administration concludes they have to go through the full rulemaking process, um, then the working group switches gears and starts the full policy review process to determine what should be in the new deregulatory rule to be put up by the administration. And finally, um, there's another method for disapproval with which the new administration will work with Congress, but on which Congress has the governing hand, the Congressional Review Act. The Congressional Review Act allows Congress to disapprove major new rules that have been put out by the Obama administration. Um, the Congressional Review Act defines a major rule as one that uh, has at least $100 million or more effect per year on the economy. Um, so there are a significant number of such rules coming out of the administration in the um, uh, midnight rule period, and they will be subject to review. But that's shorthand. The Congressional Review Act actually authorizes Congress to overturn major rules um, that go back to a defined date, um, which was within 60 business days of the last Congress. Any rule that was a major rule that was issued um, more than 60 working days prior to the old Congress going out of existence is subject to review by the incoming Congress. Um, and if they pass a resolution of disapproval, it is presented to the new president for um, his uh, signature. And um, with both political branches now under Republican control, it's certain that the new Congress will try to make greater use of this law. Um, I say greater use because it's only been used once successfully before, which was to overturn a um, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome rule um, that was issued by OSHA at the end of the um, Clinton administration that was overturned by President George W. Bush. Um, the, uh, the great advantage of the Congressional Review Act is that the bills that, are, that would repeal existing rules are exempt from filibuster in the Senate. Congress has the right at any time to overturn a rule if they can, both houses can pass a resolution and the president will sign it. But um, you skip one major step under the Congressional Review Act because there is a guaranteed vote in the Senate. Um, no filibuster can occur. And the limiting factor there is that um, uh, floor time. Um, to get considered a uh, resolution of disapproval under the Congressional Review Act must compete with everything else that is coming before Congress for consideration with the new administration. And the, um, the schedule is jammed. So under the Congressional Review Act, there is a minimum of 10 hours, I'm sorry, there is a guaranteed 10 hours floor time for debate. Um, even if the Republicans were to keep their um, debate on the floor to a minimum, there is still a requirement of five hours plus for floor time that there must be debate. And so um, the you know, majority leader in the Senate will have to care calculate carefully um, how much time he can make available for resolutions of disapproval. And then, then the difficult part of it begins. Once the you know, majority leader has figured out how much time is available, there will be intense competition from um, groups that are dissatisfied with uh, midnight regulations to get their particular rule on the list, the golden list of rules that will be considered. And finally, a couple of other points that um, are important to understand about the Congressional Review Act. Um, if a rule is disapproved under that statute, um, there is a prohibition on consideration of substantially similar rules. The agency may not just turn around and, and change the language a little and change the standards a little and issue something that is substantially similar. Nobody knows what substantially similar means because it's never made it to the courts, because the statute itself has only been used successfully once. But there will be a wave of litigation when new regulations come out as to whether they're sufficiently dissimilar that they don't run afoul of this prohibition in the Congressional Review Act. And finally, one other wild card to watch, and it is a wild card, I think, but um, in the last Congress, the one that just adjourned, the House passed a bill that would allow um, a block resolution of disapproval of many rules simultaneously. Um, and if that were to go through, 
um, the floor time problem for management of the um, um, disapproval resolutions in the Senate uh, would be substantially taken care of. That statute itself would be subject to filibuster in the Senate, so whether it would be able to get a, a block vote of disapproval through remains to be seen. But keep an eye out for that one, because if, if, if a statute uh, authorizing a blanket review of rules made it through, then the rules would change and the many more people could get their rules on the, um, the list of ones that are slated for a vote for disapproval. So that's the broad overview of the major tools that are available. Now I'll turn you over to Kara Ward to give you some specifics on executive orders and rules that might be vulnerable to being overturned during the transition and other mechanisms that might be available to President Trump and his White House staff to assert his, president, his, um, his new policy priorities on the agencies during the transition period. Thanks, Kara? Yeah, thanks so much, John. I'm, I'm so glad to be with you guys today. So, to follow up a little bit on what John was sharing, if you're looking at your, the rules that are applicable to your business or your industry, the key date to remember is that if it was a major rule, meaning that it had an economic effect of over $100 million, um, and it was published as final by June 2nd, 2016, it is now in what we call the, in the window for uh, expedited invalidation in the next Congress. So rules that, that are going to be published here from June 2nd to January 3rd, um, are, are making the list for rules that are available for this expedited Congressional Review Act treatment. Now, what that means is that once Congress comes back into session roughly on Ju uh, January 3rd, that the, they, the, the joint resolution for um, disapproval can be introduced at any time. The clock starts running on 60 uh, congressional days. Uh, actually, stay with me, it's a little bit nerdy, but it's 60 days in session when there isn't a three-day weekend. Um, that clock starts, that 60-day clock starts actually around February 15th, which is the 15th day that Congress is in session. So what that means, bottom line for, for everyone on the phone is looking at these, rule, these midnight rules coming out that are important or economically significant or major, means that you have from about February to mid-May of 2017 um, to, to get uh, enough uh, groundswell movement to have a joint resolution introduced in the House and the Senate uh, and, and that bill passed and put on the president's desk. So that may seem like a, an incredible hurdle, uh, and we can talk a little bit about what you'd be competing against as you look at your rules, but there's other dates that are also going to be important when you think about what, uh, what early tools and methods the Trump administration has to exert its policy preference. So for that, I've got a couple of these, these dates here. So, Generally, it's the second Monday in February, I believe, that the president releases his budget um, for the, the coming fiscal year. Now, considering that this president takes office and all presidents take office on January 20th, that, that February date shifts a little bit. But we may expect the, the president's budget for fiscal year 18 running from um, basically October through September, October 2017 through September 2018, to come out in the early spring. And that's going to be our first indication of the presidential priorities in, in spending and revenue sort of plans. Next, we're going to have the debt ceiling. We, we're going to run out of headroom, as we say, and we need to raise the debt ceiling sometime in mid-March. Generally, that, that legislation is a vehicle for other kinds of policy priorities to be exerted because there's usually a little bit of horse trading. We'll raise the debt limit if you lower spending in these areas. And then third, April 28th, 2017 is when the current uh, continuing resolution that's funding the government expires and a new um, appropriations bill needs to come through. And, and that's going to be an interesting opportunity also uh, to exert some, some policy preferences by this new administration. But let's dig into what the competition looks like uh, for these rules that could be subject to the Congressional Review Act. You know, what will make some of the hundred or so rules that have been published since June um, as major uh, stick out? So while it's still a very competitive process, I've developed this list based off a uh, word on the street, ear to the ground, and some of the judgment on what it takes to organize around these principles. So while it's a given that all of these rules, um, at their repeal would, would be accomplishing some sort of uh, good government and public policy purpose, um, there's certain rules that are lightning rods that mean that there's sufficient attention to be able to push them over the finish line and through the, uh, the CRA process. The first kind of way to bucket or, or explain these are, are political goals for an administration. 
And in that bucket, we can kind of see the, the education department rules on school lunches. Um, so this is a rule that basically forces uh, states uh, to require nutritional standards for school lunches. And it's right for repeal, not because all of the states hate quinoa and kale, but it's more because it, it plays into a certain narrative that uh, the Republican Party has espoused, which is that uh, it's a federalism issue. Uh, education should be uh, governed at the state level rather than at the federal level. Another one of these sort of political uh, buckets is uh, rules that uh, President Obama implemented uh, in, in accordance or to effectuate parts of the Affordable Care Act. And the third that kind of crosses over a couple of buckets are the, uh, the EPA uh, emission standards. So those are the sort of political examples, but then there's also the opportunity for a well-organized advocacy group to be able to, to make the push um, and gather enough support and signatures uh, in order to move their rule to the front of the pack. And some examples of that uh, include the, the energy department rules on appliance efficiencies, uh, possibly the prepaid card rule, the, the CFPB, and uh, nutrition labeling uh, over at the FDA. I also think it's important to note uh, that there's a couple rules that because of the June 2nd date that were previously slated or in, in conversations we're having inside the Beltway that we thought were on the list that have just fallen off the list. And that's going to be the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule uh, that came out in April. And then also the Department of Labor's overtime rule. Now that's subject to litigation and so its, it's future uh, may be decided by the courts. But as, as far as the Congressional Review Act as a tool, that's not available. Um, just returning to put this in context, um, 100 rules and the June 2nd date means that if you are thinking about what rules your industry is currently under, um, you know, the time to act is now <laughs> because uh, February will be here before you know it and those resolutions only have 60 days to be considered by the next Congress. So if the Congressional Review Act uh, is not available to you, um, for a number of reasons, maybe your rule falls out the window, uh, maybe it's not considered major, um, or maybe it's not something that uh, is able to push ahead of the pack because considering that with the floor time rules, we're judging that the number of rules that could, that could be expedited treatment under CRA is maybe half a dozen, six or seven, probably not a lot more uh, considering how busy that calendar is going to be with nomination and confirmation. Um, what are the other things that are available to you or that you should be watching if you want to protect a certain rule uh, or protect uh, certain parts of your industry? So John was able to talk a fair amount about executive orders, um, but there's a couple of other tools here in the box that will have a, a major impact on your business in relatively short order. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about how executive orders could be used. So in the Obama administration, we heard the president say that he intended to use his pen and his phone to impact public policy as a reaction to the gridlock in Congress. Um, so the pen part of that, that discussion was executive orders, uh, 249 of them to be exact. Uh, but that number is just a little bit misleading because it's actually fewer than Bush and Clinton uh, both respectively uh, enacted in their terms. But on average, and this is a rough estimate, only about 10 or 15 percent of these executive orders uh, impacted policies. Others were more administrative or handling anomalies, uh, such as there's an executive order allowing the Peace Corps to change the colors in their seal, um, and there's another executive order that sets the margins on executive orders at one inch. But let's digging into that 10 or 15 percent that are consequential EOs, um, the President, uh, President-elect Trump talked a fair amount about his intentions on the campaign trail to use the power of his office, meaning executive orders, in a couple of the areas I've highlighted below. Um, in the first case, in the first instance, he, had, he talked about using uh, the power of his office to repeal several of uh, President Obama's executive orders. And at the top of that list for me, uh, just, just reading the tea leaves here, um, were trade issues, uh, NAFTA, which was a Clinton executive order, and then um, the, the TPP, which is uh, being sort of effectuated through the executive office right now. Uh, secondly, in addition to repealing Obama's EOs, he can, of course, create his own executive orders. And John talked about the benefits and burdens of that process. Um, but it sounds like uh, if, you, if you're listening to some of his campaign promises and reading his transition tweets, 
Um, he's identified cybersecurity and immigration issues as things he wants to accomplish almost immediately. Um, and then I've included in here his, his discussion about regulatory reform. For every new regulation, two must be eliminated. That's sort of ripe for this kind of uh, forum in order to direct agency heads to think about when they, they enact new regulations. The next place that you're going to see um, policy being impacted in the, the early days of a Trump administration are going to be cabinet positions. And we're, we're hearing that discussion a fair amount in the press right now as, as the new nominations are, are being released. But you know, one of the things to remember is that there's another 4,000 positions that are appointed by the president. And it takes time to make these appointments, and those, they're going to come in several waves. So change will be more gradual to most observers. So a rough estimate is that the secretaries or the cabinet secretaries will be in this, this first wave. And then the very next wave of, of assistant secretaries and deputies of these cabinets uh, will be the second wave. And that'll be take about a year um, to get a critical mass inside each of these agencies. Um, but maybe uh, on, a, on an aggressive schedule uh, by August, a fair number of these people will be inside the agencies um, and able to, to start to impact policy and perhaps change direction from where it had been previously. So a key question will be who's going to be sticking around and for how long? Um, this is most pertinent for regulators. The typical rule of thumb is that for the heads of a, a, a regulator, they usually serve out their terms and the new appointments come in as the expiring terms roll off. However, it's their prerogative to leave if they want to. Um, and we just saw that happen with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Mary Jo White said that she intends to leave at the end of the year. Um, but a few of these other ones can be removed uh, at will, which means that they serve at the pleasure of the president. You know, a good example of that is the FBI director. So this topic is going to be particularly sensitive for the evolving, um, the evolving issues surrounding perhaps the CFPB and other agencies like the XM Bank, where um, well, in the first case, in the CFPB, where that director could only be removed uh, for cause uh, prior to a, a court case that's currently being litigated about whether or not he can be removed for cause or uh, serves at the pleasure of the president. Um, and then, you know, another one would be another issue that will pop up, and you'll probably want to watch your regulator closely for this, is a situation similar to sort of the XM board, where the expiring terms of the current agency's heads um, means that there, is, there can't be, or the way that law is, is, is uh, put together, that the expiring terms uh, mean that the position remains vacant until a new appointment is made, which is anomalous and unusual in federal practice because usually um, the people with an expiring term are allowed to serve in some interim capacity until their replacement is named. But with a, a required vacancy that can paralyze a regulator for some significant period of time. You know, last, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about direct congressional uh, action separate from the Congressional Review Act, and John touched on this a little bit. Um, when you talk about regulations, it's, it's interesting to, to always remember that legislation can invalidate uh, regulations outside the CRA process, and they can actually you know, repeal a law. We're seeing that in some draft legislation uh, that's going to be uh, the topic of a significant amount of conversation in the next administration, which is the Financial Choice Act. You know, in that, that act itself, the, the primary text is repealing the Volcker Rule and the Durbin Amendment for financial uh, service industry folks. Um, but there's other ways, too, that also that legislation can uh, not get at the regulation, but actually go to the underlying statute um, and rewrite that part of the statute so that the regulation needs to be rewritten or is invalidated. Um, typically, though, if you're going to look for a straight line item to repeal a particular rule, it's not going to be standalone legislation. It's going to be part of a bigger package, which is why those key dates I was talking about earlier in my presentation can be important. Um, you know, people are talking a little bit about that appropriations bill uh, in April to be a place where a number of different regulations could get repealed um, uh, in, in somewhat short order. And lastly, we were talking a little bit about that appropriations date. You know, the power of the purse can't be can't, cannot be over-exaggerated. So when we see that budget document come out uh, from the President for fiscal year 18 spending, assuming that he does one, um, we'll start to get a sense of, of where the priorities will be, uh, what agencies are on, on the up and up, which ones are down. And uh, the other option that's available in this appropriations process is, is appropriations riders, which is saying something to the effect of 
no funds may be expended by this agency in furtherance of either writing a rule or um, implementing a rule or enforcing a rule. Uh, that can be a somewhat uh, tricky uh, way to invalidate a rule, and it's usually only as good as long as that funding period or that fiscal year or that continuing re resolution, but it, it, it can make change pretty quickly. Um, and then lastly, without getting uh, too far into the weeds on it, the reconciliation process is something that we're going to be seeing uh, when we talk about federal spending and revenue. Uh, we might see two reconciliation bills come through, and what this means is expedited legislation that moves the needle a little bit on how much Congress is spending uh, or taking in, and it's it's an only important because it's not subject to Senate filibuster rules, which means that you only need a, a simple majority for it to pass. And uh, in probably other contexts, and when you read a newspaper, you're, you might be hearing the rumor that the Affordable Care Act um, tax provisions could be uh, repealed or rolled back significantly by the first reconciliation that we could see uh, in the spring or summer of this year. But with that, um, I'll be glad to answer questions at the end of the presentation, but I want to make sure that we give uh, my colleague Larry Norton the opportunity to talk about legal and ethical considerations in this new administration. Well, thank you very much, Kara. I'm Larry Norton, and I co-chair our political law group, and I, I think we hope, if anything, is abundantly clear at this point in the presentation it's that we're in for a tremendous period of flux uh, in regard to federal government policymaking and rulemaking, and as Kara said, the time to act is now. And we're going to conclude the presentation with a review of some important ethical and legal considerations that always apply in regard to your interactions with government employees and officials, but are particularly important to pay attention to because uh, they have changed uh, recently in some cases, and in regard to the ethics rules, which we'll start with, are going to change on January 1st. So, so let's start here. Beginning on January 1st, the, government, uh, the Office of Government Ethics has adopted and will make effective rules that affect any gifts, um, anything that outside sources provide to government officials or employees that, is in, that, that, that provides them with anything of value. And we've highlighted some of the more significant changes uh, here. One is that uh, officials are going to be required to obtain written authorization in all cases where they have been invited to attend widely attended gatherings, regardless of whether they are speaking. And this, this widely attended gathering phrase refers to things like receptions, galas, charity fundraisers, and things like that. As some of you know, many agencies already require this as an agency matter, but now this is going to be true across the government. Uh, second big change is that speakers at widely attended gatherings will now be able to accept a separate meal for presenters. So in the past, the rule restricted uh, a public official, somebody, a secretary or some senior official from uh, an executive branch office, restricted them to accept food, refreshments, and materials that were furnished to all in, in, uh, attendees as an integral part of the event. Now, now speakers can show up at this dinner before the event or something like that. There's a new exception in the rules for informational materials, meaning materials that uh, have some sort of educational or instructive value. There's always been an exception for this in the, in the congressional gift rules. Uh, now there's a corollary in the executive branch rules. There's a new exception that allows government officials to attend receptions hosted by their former employer. So even a Department of Defense official, let's say, uh, would be able to attend a, a party or uh, that's held by uh, his former uh, government contractor uh, employer, so long as all employees, all other former employees, or, or many other former employees, are invited to the event. Uh, in a um, bit of arcana in the new rules, the ethics rules now uh, say clarify that the carve out for providing from the gift rules for providing an official with a modest item of food or refreshment refers to food and non-alcoholic beverages, does not include alcoholic beverages. That doesn't mean that there's a complete ban now on outside sources providing alcohol uh, to federal employees, but it would need to fall under some other gift rule exception, either the one that exists for de minimis gifts under $20 or as part of a widely attended gathering. And finally, um, 
apologies to Mark Zuckerberg. For those of you who have hundreds of Facebook friends uh, and want to consider those individuals as, uh, as uh, people you have a personal relationship with and can therefore give gifts under that exception uh, to, the, to the federal gift rules, the, the, the new uh, Office of Government Ethics rules clarify that a social media relationship without more, without communicating in a personal capacity, carrying on extensive personal interactions, meeting socially outside of work, that merely adding somebody to your Facebook friends doesn't uh, allow you to fall under the personal friendship exception. Uh, the rules also identify some factors that government officials and employees should consider for declining gifts. These are non-binding, but are essentially intended to prevent uh, the appearance of uh, impropriety. So where you've got a gift that has a particularly high value or some expectation that the individual may have interest before the agency, this is the, you know, the, in, the, in the colloquial phrase, this is, you know, what would your mother say or how that would this look uh, uh, on the Washington Post test. Um, but these are non-binding factors now that government officials are supposed to use in considering whether to accept something of value from a third party. Well, not only will the Washington, D.C. real estate market be turning over over the next few months, but many employees uh, within the federal government will be looking for jobs uh, in the private sector as the turnover takes place within the administration. And it's important to know that there are new rules that took effect in August that govern those interactions that you have as a private employer or nonprofit entity uh, with those who are within the government. So. Uh, to highlight just a few, senior government employees, and that includes employees at the GS-15 level and above, are now required to notify their agency ethics officials when they're involved in negotiations with prospective employers, something that they were supposed to always do. But now they've got to also identify the name of the prospective employer and the date negotiations began. This is an upshot of the recently passed uh, Stock Act uh, by Congress. The rule also uh, expands the situations where employees may, may have to recuse themselves from matters. The recusal used to be limited to so-called particular matters involving the prospective employer, but the new rules say that the employee must recuse if he's he or she is talking to a prospective employer and is handling a matter that could have a direct and predictable effect on the financial interests of the employer. This could even include now a rulemaking that might affect the prospective employer's industry. There are a bunch of new rules that provide guidance on social media and online hiring. So, for example, when an online resume distribution service sends a resume, an employee's resume to a prospective employer and tells the employee that it's done so, that employee is now considered to be seeking employment under the rules and have to recuse themselves, themselves from particular matters. And this comes up in some cases through LinkedIn and, and um, other um, uh, social media where a company reaches out to an employee, the employee may now be considered to be seeking employment unless he or she specifically rejects the overture. And, and the, the rules even suggest language to the effect of, I am not talking to anyone about employment until I leave the government. So agencies, uh, it's important to remember, as with the gift rules, are free to supplement the rules that restrict these interactions. But to the extent that you are talking to or thinking about approaching individuals in the government about opportunities of employment with your company or association, it's important to remember that effective August of this year, new rules apply to those interactions. Well, we have an inauguration uh, in Washington next month, and that's another um, uh, opportunity uh, for uh, interaction with um, officials and incoming officials. A few things uh, we just wanted to highlight about that. Uh, one is that um, organizations, corporations, and individuals, uh, so long as they're U.S. citizens, may make monetary contributions to the official inauguration committee. Uh, there's no limit on those amounts, but it's important to remember that the official committee is required to publicly disclose the contributions that it receives. And if you, your, your, your company or your association is registered under the Lobbying Disclosure Act, this is a reportable disbursement that would have to be included in your uh, semi-annual lobbying disclosure report, uh, which is due at the end of January. 
There will, of course, be lots of private, privately sponsored events going on uh, across and around the city uh, during the inauguration. A couple things to keep in mind there. Uh, rules really are going to vary depending on the entity that's hosting that event. So if, for instance, you have a PAC that's, that's connected to your company or to your trade association, you can raise money for your uh, inaugural event, but those um, contributions are going to be subject to the same rules that apply when you're raising money for other purposes, the same limits uh, under the campaign finance rules. If you're a trade association or other 501c group, you may be hosting a policy conference or a fundraising benefit. Um, generally, it's fine to use uh, corporate funds, raise corporate funds for the purpose of that event. Important there, though, too, to make sure that you vet the fundraising for compliance with any applicable campaign finance rules and for any tax laws. While the transition is in full gear right now, we read about it every day, and it's, uh, some of it, of course, is going on uh, in New York and is, um, receives lots of attention and, and, and visibility, but much of it is going on in the trenches uh, between officials who are appointed or individuals who are appointed to serve uh, as transition officials uh, and the employees within the agencies. They're assessing uh, the situation, the priorities, and providing reports for the incoming administration. Um, the people who are working on the transitions are private sector employees, and so they are uh, not government employees and are not subject uh, to, um, generally speaking, the federal ethics laws and gift laws that we talked about earlier. It would be appropriate, for instance, if someone is working for the transition uh, and is a lead from a, from a company for the company to uh, pay for that employee's hotel expenses and um, meals during the period they may be in Washington working on the transition. That's not considered um, a gift to that, that official. Um, however, if you are interacting with government officials and employees uh, in connection with the transition, any kind of communication with employees about the transition, those communications may be considered lobbying and trigger disclosure or registration uh, under the Lobbying Disclosure Act, depending on whether the substance of the communication is to attempt to influence public policy. So that can include uh, conversations with many of the employees in the executive office of the president, admirals, generals, uh, and, and many top senior executive service employees. Final point on transition is to remember that there are uh, confidentiality agreements that are in place that apply to uh, private sector individuals who are working on the transi transition, and individuals <laughs> who use information obtained through that work on the transition uh, in connection with securities trading might be subject to uh, insider trading laws. So even though a lot of the activity uh, is unregulated and conducted by private sector officials, important to remember that the lobbying, gift rules, insider trading, and other confidentiality considerations can come into play. And that wraps up my part of the presentation. All right, guys, this is uh, Mark Pryor again, and thank, I want to thank the panelists for doing this. Uh, we have a few moments here for questions, and for those who want to ask questions, if you haven't already, please submit those through the chat feature uh, for the webinar. And um, we have several requests for the presentation of the slides, and for, um, excuse me, for the slide presentation, and we'll be sending those out to all attendees. So if you want those, you don't have to ask. We're going to send them to you. And we do have our first question is from Robert, and it's on executive orders, and I'll get either Kara or John to answer that one. Sure. Thanks so much, Senator Pryor. I also want to add that when we send out the, the slides, we're also going to be including this work product that lists all of the major rules enacted uh, from June 2nd to present. And uh, I think that will be really helpful. It will be organized by agency and regulator, so you can dig through to see if there's any on that list that could impact your business or your industry. But turning to the question, we have a question from Robert. And I'll read it. It says, using the sick leave executive order, for example, what would the new administration need to do to actually overturn or rescind that EO, especially given that it's now regulatory? 
such as the rule was published in the Federal Register? Can the new administration simply issue a new EO overturning it, and if so, doesn't the regulation still exist? This is a great question, and it goes to the heart of uh, the impact a president can have with his pen and his phone in the executive order. So um, just playing out this example and the hypothetical, and I, I, I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about the, the federal sick leave for, or sick leave for federal workers executive order, but here's how it could work as an example. The president elect or sorry, pres then President Trump would need to issue an executive order uh, that would say something to the effect of uh, the executive order issued by a number blankety blank issued by President Obama on this date is, uh, is hereby revoked and the underlying authorities to direct rulemaking uh, by the um, whoever did the sick leave regulation is also amended. It is no longer a statement of policy of this administration. That would then kick it to that, to that office to rescind the regulation subject to the uh, uh, APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, and it would be subject to notice and comment where they'd have to affirmatively say that the underlying basis for the regulation, considering that executive orders have the effect of law, the law has changed and this is no longer effective, we are hereby withdrawing. And there would be possibly an interim final date, meaning that upon publication of that notice, the, the rule could be rescinded. So it could happen very quickly, but it would at least be sequential. Executive order first, then agency action under the Administrative Procedures Act. Okay, it, it looks like uh, we're really pretty much at our end time here, so uh, we do probably have a few more questions, but we'll try to respond to those uh, if they come in separately. I want to thank everyone for being here. Again, this is Mark Pryor, and we appreciate you uh, tuning in, so to speak, uh, to Venable, and we're here to answer questions and help in any way. Please feel free to contact us. If there's follow-up, we'll send you the slides. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have further questions or concerns or uh, headaches as you go. So again, I want to thank the panel. I want to thank all of you all for listening in today and participating, and hope you have a great day. Thank you.